All right, so it should be all good. Yeah, we'll be recording now. All right, so let me start. So what I want us to do is to go through the paper uh, together. I highlighted some of the main uh, sessions I wanna go over with you. Uh, and that's uh, one first way for us to go over uh, just a few topics all together here. And uh, let me just see how I can uh, make this. Oops, let me. Yeah, okay. So um, demographic gaps or preparation gaps, the large impact of incoming preparation on performance of the students in introductory physics, and uh, so it's a, as you see, the universities that they used to collect the data from were Stanford and then Cornell and then University of Colorado at Boulder. So even though it's not explicitly said in the article, those were the institutions. And so uh, this is a good one. Sometimes good articles have a nice introduction that gives you a lot of good references. This actually was a nice one written modestly apart from my point of view. So it, it is, um, its approach is just uh, talking about the fact that there are, have been many uh, mining of the data of uh, physics students, um, what promotes, what is its success for physics students nowadays and, and, and mining the, the data of AC, ACTs or SATs and, and any math background or any uh, con preconcept inventory. A lot of previous data you have GPA, you have from the students, try to mine that, that data and see if it predicts well what is their performance in the final grade and performance in physics. So there's been a lot of studies about that. But this one is trying to now understand more deeply what's inside, what causes these differences, right? What causes uh, uh, this, um, the change, what, why did some of these predictors work better than the others? So physics education researchers have made great progress in finding teaching methods that result, result in improve, improvement in teaching learning. So there's a, a few references there, nice reference for peer instruction, studio physics, interactive engagement, active learning, et cetera. Those are the general ones you go to to change your class to more active learning. And why am I mentioning this now? As you see the sample that they have here for from Boulder, from Stanford, from, um, uh, from Cornell, they are excellent students. The, <laughs> this is all students that somehow, even, even though for one of the institutions, the article says it was an interactive engagement, it must be something very special happening at those institutions. So they are quite different from I'm, I'm to the normal two-year college, I would say. Certainly different from mine. So uh, the, most of these institutions are using one or more of this, uh, of this in active engagement, uh, uh, right? Procedures to teach better. A recent and growing focus has been on to go beyond average and overall normalized gains to look at how teaching methods impact the different students in different ways. And there's an image, a lot of papers on the case of the gender, uh, analyzing gender, analyzing first uh, generation students, analyzing underrepresent, uh, underrepresented, uh, underrepresented minorities, etc. So this paper here is about uh, three different um, is about three different institutions. I'm already telling you, Cornell, Boulder, and Stanford. Only Boulder is the public one. And, um, and what they did is they are looking at the score of the final exam in the, in the large introductory physics class, calculus-based physics class. So what they are looking at is basically the SAT or ACT scores, the math, the math part of mathematics part of this, this scores, right, that they get when they get out of high school. Then two, the, of course, they will have demographic information such as gender, if it is a first generation that's called FG or if it's underrepresented minority that will be URM. And uh, they will also compare all that, see search for relationships with all that with the pre-course concept inventory. That means a pre-score on the FCI or the FMCI. <clears throat> all right, so, oops. 
Oops, wow, I shifted a lot here. <laughs> Let me go slowly here. Oh, da, 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 chat, chat. Wow, I can't do that. Interesting. So let me get out of this. Something funky happens that it doesn't allow me to do too much here. All right. So first, second page, what I would like to, to highlight over here is uh, there are negative consequences of labeling gaps as demographic gaps when these gaps are not arising from demographic status per se, but from, from factor, uh, factors correlated with it, right? So he highlights that correlating, well, they highlight correlating mislabeling uh, can result in bias. They have negative expectations, right? from both the instructors and any in students. So, so the most important result, so the summary of this paper, you can even read in the abstract, is that the most important result is that the analysis it reveals that differences in the math SAT or ACT scores and the pre-FCI or FCME, FMC, um, which are uh, used as admittedly crude proxies of incoming preparation were sufficient to explain the performance gaps between demographic groups in our data. So you don't need to say that the issue is gender. You don't need to say that the issue is because it's first uh, generation of college students. You don't need to say that it's because they are underrepresented uh, minorities to explain why these groups uh, 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 to explain the underperformance sometimes of these groups. It is really directly correlated to, to their preparation. That is, uh, so the demographics are not needed to explain that. Now, the demographics play roles in other aspects, but on the, so blaming the, 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 the performance, the differences in performance due to the demographics is not necessary as, as the preparation explains the difference. So I'll, I'll be careful here with the words because I highlighted later how we, th this paper is not explaining all the underperformance differences of students, okay? So there is, so you can bring back to the table the issue of demographics to analyze even other effects, but but certainly, uh, well, the, the, so certain other minor effects later on. So the distinctions in performance are between students with good preparation in physics and poor preparation in physics. And this distinction is the same across all demographic groups, meaning they were able to, with all these demographic groups, explain those gaps of performance just by, under, uh, by comparing that with their uh, the incoming preparation. And the incoming preparation is measured with the SATs and the pre-concept uh, inventory scores. So in purple here are some of the questions that were not answered by the paper, but some of the questions that they hope will be then investigated out of this paper. So how can instructors best address the range of students in their class in their instruction, right? Uh, there is an inherent range of physics preparation in every class. So how much of this is due to the weakness of their preparation? How much is a result of instruction and all the possible factors bringing back to the table demographics uh, because that has, uh, there are social psychological issues related with demographics that can still play a role. So we're not completely discarding uh, uh, demographics, but uh, blaming on the performance in the demographics alone is, um, this paper is arguing, is not a good idea. And you shouldn't do it as there are, uh, as there can be negative consequences. And the preparation gap explains uh, things better than, explains enough than just addressing the demographics. Okay, so in pink here, I highlighted the, the tools that they're using to, to do this analysis. And they use multiple regression and they use also at the same time, the structural equation modeling, SEM. Um, so what are the, oh, okay. So it's still on the questions answer to be asked by, to, to come out of this. Um, what forms of instruction are the most effective at achieving success for the maximum number of students? So. Once we go through this paper and say, 
we we understand that the uh, the gap then is is an important part of the gap of the performance is certainly the under preparation of students how can we better address that so they have a few suggestions at the end but this is still an open question that this paper is not really answering uh is just pointing that to the fact that we need to 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 address the the, the preparation gap all right, so where were the questions of this paper? How much variation in performance can be explained by uh, the incoming student characteristics? So the SATs, the, uh, the pre-CI uh, scores. What are some of the underlying mechanisms for gender, first generation, underrepresentative minority academic performance gaps that justify singling out, right? Singling out these particular gaps. And they found that there are no, not enough mechanisms to justify just singling out those gaps just due to a gender, gender or um, first time or URM. How similar are the answers uh, from one and two um, for different institutions? They found uh, a lot of similarities between the all the, the all the institutions, the three institutions at the end. So we are not providing answers to these questions that apply to all populations of college students. As you see, they they have a very selective population over here, but um, but it's it's a, as a start on this type of study. This, by the way, is an editor pick. This article is an editor suggestion as well. So they are doing some things that um, that are uh, they are piercing uh, the, some some results here that are quite different from from other papers. Because if you actually browse and look, and I'll mention a few, there's a lot of papers on mining student data, right? And some have, part, some have partial results that are conflicting with this one, but indeed all of them are going towards the same direction in that gender gap and, and demographics gaps are not, a, that you don't need to use demographics to explain a lot of the gaps in instruction. So uh, the methods that they use the data is a highly selective from a highly selective East Coast University Basically, they label it as HSEC, it's Cornell. A highly selective West Coast University, they labeled HSWC, it's a Stanford. And a public research university in the middle of the country, they labeled PM, it's Boulder. How did you figure that out? It's, well, it, they never said. <laughs> it's right here. Also, the, all the collaborators are from. Here. Oh, okay, okay, never mind. Yeah, and I mean, yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, but that's still a good question because you know, in seeing that, uh, you know, they use the code words like H S E C. You know, it's like it's a university that rhymes with Banford, but you know, we can't tell what it is. So. <laughs> yeah, um, there's, so many, there's so many papers that do that, and it's so annoying because it's so easy to find out. I don't know. They keep using that language. Oh, this such and such land grant university yeah. in the West or something like that. <laughs> So, I'm so naive. I just assumed they wouldn't put their names, their schools' names there if that was them. Yeah. yeah I know. <laughs> the data we have for all three institutions are gender, under representing minority, full uh, first generation status, SAT scores, physics one uh, exam score, right? And the pre CI, I don't know why I didn't mark that, the pre concept inventory. All right. So moving on, so this is the population of students. This is what we have. So from Cornell, there is 194 plus 185 students. From Stanford, 466 plus 518. From Boulder, about 1,000 1, students. The numbers from Cornell are small, okay? I think statistically, this is small. Um, here I highlighted the percentage the how many students in this sample were above the, the top 10% in their high school class. Look at that. In the Cornell, 86% of the students were ab above the 10% of the class. In Stanford, 96%. Now in Boulder, 90, 29%. Boulder is the public institution, right? So quite different in this, right? So these are really like overachievers. Furthermore, look at this. I highlighted also the 
uh, average uh, math SAT or ACT scores that they are bringing. And this is already a percentile. So 97% for the kids going to Cornell and being analyzed here, and 97% for the Stanford ones and 89% for the Boulder above the average. So, you know, um, these are really high achievers students. This is a population very different from the population I see in my classes. Also, when, the, when you talk about the normalized pre, uh, pre, uh, pre and post gain. So now when you analyze the pre and the post together, right? So the gain at the end of the, so this is the range of these values is right around 0.4 for all these classes or here even 0.5, something like that. So these are all enormous gains, guys. Um, let me tell you. So for instance, if you gra grab a paper like this, this is um, from Von Korf in 2016, uh, where they got the FCI database for 31,000 students, okay? So a, a, an FCI score when you're doing a introductory physics, uh, when you're doing traditional uh, teaching is around 0.22. But when you're doing a, a interactive engagement techniques is around like 0.35. So those are very large gains in general for this population. So this, these guys are already privileged in many senses, but anyway, there you go. All right, so that's what I want to point about the, the population uh, of students they were analyzing here. So in pink again is their uh, technique, their method. And um, so you're going to see coefficients. The next table is, is really the results. You're going to see coefficients for, of, of their multiple uh, regression. And these coefficients, I just want to say they were um, standard, they were normalized. And so each one of those coefficients represent a fraction of a standard deviation in the outcome variable, right? So we'll see. Uh, so basically these coefficients, they, they are the, the multi-regression, multi-linear, multi, multiple regression uh, results. The B coefficient is a fraction of the variance explained by the predictor. The predictors will be, they will test, is it gender, is it, first time uh, generation, first generation, is it underrepresented in min minority? So try, they will try different predictors. Is it, is it the uh, CI scores? Is it the um, SAT scores? So this B is that fraction variance and it goes up to one. They normalize it. So basically this B will be representing the uh, gap, the performance gap. Uh, we focus, they focus their analysis using R squared, okay? And also they, at the same time, the, on the multi-regression analysis, they also used uh, this, a K, I, I don't know even to pronounce, I've never heard this before, a cake uh, information criteria, the I, I, AIC. So basically the R square we use even in class with our students, right? To do our simple labs. And we know the larger the R square, the better the model fit. For the I, A, AIC, the, the smaller the AIC, the better the model. So in the regression analysis, the regression analysis on its own cannot directly explore the relationship between predictors. So to do that, they also employed this um, structural equation modeling, right? And um, also is something I'm not very, uh, I'm not uh, aware. I mean, uh, I don't have experience with SEM, but they have a whole appendix on that and they highlight uh, a paper as a, a primer for that. On the statistics, they were, you know, are using a, a NOVA and uh, variance statistics and they were using packages using R in case you want to know. That was the language they were doing very much used for a lot of population statistics. All right, so here's the data. And uh, they're, they're showing their main data in two main ways, okay? So here's the table and the main table with the numbers. And here in next, I'll show you the plot summarizing this, this, this information that is there in the data. So in the plot, you have here in the y-axis, the demographic 
gaps, which is the B values that are on the table over there, okay? So here's for gender, here's for underrepresented minorities, this is for first generation. So I'm gonna go back now to the table and let's take a look. So the point that they are making here is the following that, um, so first, uh, when you just try to fit your data using just the gender as a predictor for, to explain the, the performance gap, uh, you get that gender would be related, would, would, there would be a 30% or so factor, the 0 0.28, et cetera, 30% or so factor, uh, uh, helping to explain uh, differences in the score of the variance, et cetera. And uh, the R square values are quite small. And then, then they created models where they included um, with the gender in the multiple regression models, they included the math SAT score and then later the math SAT and the pre-CI concept inventory score. So put all the three together in this multiple regression analysis. And what they find is that the R square improves a lot. So the math, uh, the, the three predictors together, so the math SAT and the CI and the gender uh, fit the data much better, okay? And so that's why I'm highlighting here how the R square uh, really improves, okay? Going when you have the three factors all together. And that's what you see here also in the case of underrepresented minorities, you see the R square really improving when you have the three factors together, the math, SAT, ACT, and the pre uh, score, a concept inventory score. Same for first generation, the R square improves, improves a lot. Uh, and basically the B value at, uh, at the end, uh, once you include the CI and the math, the B value goes to practically zero, meaning that the gap that was in initially just associated with gender is fully explained by introducing the CI and the math, okay? And the math, uh, SAT, ACT. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the, I can go back to this later, but that's the general um, outcome of this. There are a few little nuances that are different here. And I think they are better explained when we look at the graph. So basically what he's, they're saying here is that the changing gender coefficient the B, the B is the coefficient, okay? Implies significant average differences in the CI pre-scores between males and females. So what he, they're saying here is the following, is that when you go from analyzing just gender to gender plus the math SATs, you still don't see big improvement from the first data set to the second data set, you don't see that big improvement, but you see an enormous improvement when you put the, the concept inventory now to try to explain everything. So what they are saying here with these numbers is not as clear, but now with this graph, it's much more clear. So you see here, now look at just the gender and you see the bars. Uh, now when there is the demographic uh, is the reason of the demographic gap is just gender. And here when it's gender in green, gender in, in the SATs. And then in yellow down here is when it is gender SAT and the concept inventory. So for the case of gender, the concept, adding the concept inventory reduced the gap really to insignificant values. So therefore in the case of gender, uh, the concept inventory, so early knowledge of physics was really important to understand the difference between performance of males and females. It was not the math as ma male and female had similar math scores and that was not the issue, but early knowledge of physics really then that gap of early knowledge of physics explained the difference between males and females. So you don't even need to use just males and females, but label it as a preparation gap, especially in the subject of physics. Uh, then when he talks about the underrepresented minorities, the coefficient, when the math SATs and ACT scores were added to the model, the uh, underrepresented minority gap drastically reduced, okay? So that's what we are seeing here. There is less consistency, more variation across the institutions here than what we saw in for gender. 
So these are the three institutions here, no? First, the East Coast, the West Coast, and the Middle. So a lot of variation between the institutions, but essentially, again, the error bars for the East Coast institution were large, but if you, essentially what this is saying is that uh, the, 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 the gender gap, the, the, the URM gap gets explained when you add the, the CI scores. Even the SAT scores, you're already reducing that blue bar by a lot. Here, there's a variation on that institution, right? And then for the first generation gap, so the far, final set of, 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 of uh, your bars here, there is less obvious consistency across the institutions. But when you control for the CI scores, when you look at the, the sort of yellow here bar, uh, it, it has eliminated the difference between the institutions, right? Certainly has decreased uh, the blue bars, with the initial bar where you just accounted for the, the first uh, generation students. So the preparation certainly helps to explain things, but uh, not as much as, as it did on the other, uh, on the other two beam. To, to cases predictors over here. All right, so overall, the majority of uh, underrepresented minorities and first generation gaps could be explained by the math SAT scores, while math SAT ACT scores was negligible in explaining the gender gap. However, all of the gender gap could be explained by the CI scores. Okay, so that's their strong uh, conclusions over here out of those bar bars and those bar charts. So in summary, while demographic performance gaps on the physics one final exam uh, exists at these institutions, the gaps can be explained by differences in student income in preparation as estimated by the two measures of math SAT or ACT and CI scores. So in Appendix B, now to reinforce this, because this was an analysis basically using the multi, uh, multi, multiple regression, right? And now uh, you do the same thing uh, with, the, uh, with the SEM. And with the SEM, it confirms that demographic gaps in the final exam scores are mediated by incoming preparation. So there was a um, another way of checking uh, all of this, right? Um, as before I go any further, as I was reading this and I was browsing through the appendix and try to digest all of that, let me tell you that also, um, for instance, these are things that I'm, I'm concerned and I show uh, to my students and we talk about, for instance, you can read about is R square useless? So concerning statistics, R-square can be problematic to do a lot of analysis based on R-square, right? So uh, so as, as I was reading, these guys certainly were uh, very careful in using a lot of adjusted R-square in checking on the uh, significance, right? The p-value, the significance of their data, et cetera, and, uh, and the values of the R-square or not, absurdly high. So there's a lot of things to take into consideration before you can really digest and, and, and trust the R squared. So it seems to me, of course, this is a published paper and all, but a degree of criticism from everyone is always uh, healthy. So pay attention to all these things. It seems to me they were taking all the cares necessary before trusting R squared. And they use other models to confirm it to other techniques independent on the multiple linear regression and the R squared. Um, concerning the final exams, because they were the, the gaps, right, uh, of performance uh, were measured in respect to this, this final exam. And then it, you, you ask about the consistency of uh, how this final exam was for each, each different institution, right? So the consistency, at Boulder was probably because, so Boulder had a, a consistency of the, uh, it's talking about the final exam. So the, there was a standard body of exam questions from which the questions were chosen and instructors reviewed the exam to uh, ensure equivalence. At uh, 
Cornell, the instructor was the same across the years that were picked for this research here. And for the Stanford, the exams have both open-ended and multiple choice questions. The, in Boulder, the exams have only multiple choice questions with more emphasis on the conceptual understanding. And in Cornell, the exams were a combination of short answers, multiple choice questions, okay? So yeah, all this, so imagine you have all these different exams now being analyzed in, in that, uh, together in, in one sample. So they also performed this thing called the failure analysis, which is just another way I invite you to, you can look in the appendix C, they, they're detailing this, uh, which is just another way of showing their results. So they show the results with this bar chart and the, the previous tables over here. And another way of translating and showing these results, uh, putting it in, another, in other words, is that a student who comes in with a preparation in the bottom quartile, has about a, fr a factor of four higher probability of being in the bottom quartile of the grade distribution than a student who starts the course in the upper quartile of the preparation. So it sets back the student. So this, this whole thing is, is showing a probability that it set back the, student, the students four times more likely coming underprepared to also do poorly at the end. So anyway, um, that's uh, the, the explaining that failure um, analysis. So the discussion is that the first notable uh, result in this analysis is the degree of similarity across the three institutions in spite of having different admissions criteria and selectivity and uh, locally defined physics courses and final exams. Now, with a grain of salt, again, I, I thought there was quite a bit of uh, variation between the institutions, but what they mean I, is that in general, by adding the math SATs and the CI, looking at the linear regression, the multiple linear factor regression, you can see that the R squared does improve, that the, uh, it seems to explain a lot of the gap, Right, and so that was the similarity that they are mentioning. All right, uh, so um, so what this this paper is showing is that the variation in the final exam scores predicted by these two factors, the math SAT, ACT, and the CI scores, is about thirty percent in both cases. So all this paper is really explaining a thirty percent uh, of the of the disparities in, in the, a 30% factor in explaining the disparities in the final exams, okay? In, in the prediction of the results in the final exam. So there's only a 30% explanation coming from under preparation, right? So this is not explaining everything. Under preparation of the students will explain about 30% of the of why they're not getting uh, the expected result at the end. So there are other factors. Um, back again to analyzing the final exam. This is discussing. So the final exams appear rather similar. That's what the paper is saying. It's uh, so you see. I wouldn't quite say so, but here you go. So the teaching methods they say uh, at uh, in Cornell for the years selected for this research were 2012, I think 2013, the course was largely traditional. They say that since then it has been modified. Boulder was quite interactive with peer instruction and tutorials, right? And at, at um, Stanford was something in between. I guess the paper can say that they appear rather similar as when you look at the average CI scores and the average uh, SATs and all, right? Uh, well, the average uh, final score here, right? Uh, or when they were selecting the population, maybe you can say that you, you can add, uh, argue some more uniformity after you look at this normalized pre-post gain. So the final result at the end of a semester that they get all pretty large gains. So somehow even the, the institution that was doing more of a traditional 
teaching methods in 2012, 2013, somehow was doing some magic there that traditional wasn't as traditional as we get. Because if you teach just traditional methods, you, you should be getting to gains of the order of like uh, this normalized gains of the order of like 0.2. So that's, that's my understanding of all of these. So, okay. So these were really, this was really a special sample. Maybe the sample was a special and not actually the instruction. So that's another point to, to, to take into consideration. Oops, hold on guys, we are almost there, okay. Um, all right, so then going back over here, it is notable that uh, the math SATs or ACT and SCI scores are two rather crude proxies for incoming preparation, right? So the math SATs covers a variety of math knowledge and uh, little, it has little importance to students' success in Physics 1. It has been measured. So the math in Physics 1 at Stanford indicates that their performance was not, no indication that the performance was limited by the math. So when you address how much the math was important in the performance of, of those students, when you address in another way, and they don't see that correlation of the math in the performance in physics. So, so that's puzzling because the SATs, ACT math scores did correlate. So, so we attribute the significance of the math SAT or ACT scores, not to the math per se, but rather how this score represents some broader level of math science preparation. These things give me a headache. So, this work, I mean, it's confusing, but this work shows that it is important to have both general and physics specific measures of incoming preparation. You know? And I totally agree, right? Reading all this and especially to, and to explain the gender gap also, because we see the gender gap that the discipline specific results with the pre-CI scores were much more important than any math uh, difference. There was no math difference between genders, but there was a lot more math, more difference with discipline specific, physics specific. So we cannot identify what factors are important in determining the level of incoming preparation. We initially expected that it would be differences in what high school physics courses were taken, but we analyzed that for uh, Stanford. Uh, say, so they had data for Stanford to see how many of their students had taken high school physics. Um, and they found that all the demographic groups at Stanford had the same distribution, even though the groups had different average CI pre-scores and math SAT scores. Meaning that having taken high school physics or not was not uh, it was not correlating, at least for the data they had for Stanford. This also gives me a huge headache. Um, very confusing in a sense, because you would expect that to be a correlation there as well. All right, so a lot of the results of these papers are consistent with the findings at cost at all. I'll show you that later, a bit of that. So we cannot rule out some contribution from social psychological factors such as test anxiety and stereotype threat. And in conclusion, we observe significant demographic gaps in final exam scores for all three institutions. However, when we controlled for student income in preparation, all, in all cases, the gaps became, became insignificant or drastically reduced in size. And that, Basically, this SAT and the uh, concept inventory predict 20 to 30 percent of the variation in the final exam score. So don't predict everything; just 20 to 30 percent. So there's a lot another, say, 70 percent that is coming from where, right? So, so, so then where is it coming from? And for instance, the paper from Cost et al. Uh, highlights a lot of all the possible. This is a paper from 2009. That's the one that they are highlighting is the same kind of results. And so they are saying here differences in the average. Well, they're talking about instructor differences, course specifics, you know, how the curriculum is implemented, fine grained choices impact the overall performance of the students. 
So obviously this is still ground for more specific study, but it's getting hard for these people to pinpoint uh, what else in a very uh, homogeneous way, too, right? So as they say here in purple, we are carrying out further studies to find out what are these important hidden variables that determine the rest of the variants, okay? So they are only seeing a fraction of the variance, which is much less than one, indicating that there are other possible uh, variables in student success, right? So incoming preparation explains just a third of the variance. It doesn't explain everything. So the analysis of this paper is just correlational, not ca causational, right? To explain the cause. Uh, it is possible that there is some unmeasured factor, for instance, test anxiety that causes both lower scores, right? Uh, or measures of incoming preparation and lower final scores. Yep, that's it. And concerning uh, suggestions, right, um, on how to improve things, they just mentioned things such as, uh, it's plausible that adjusting the course level to better match the preparation of the less prepared students would improve their performance and reduce the sensitivity to the preparation. Another option would be to provide greater resources in teaching of the course, such as classes with more instructor time or adding courses to the sequence to provide a greater range of students, uh, to, of students the opportunity to start a course matched to their preparation. Uh, the appendices comes later, but you, we don't need to go through that because you, you already have an idea uh, of the essence here. Uh, I, my personal concerns when I read all these things, and these are just thoughts in progress, not rigid criticism, but conversation starters are, was the data enough everywhere? Uh, was the statistic robust enough? Uh, and, and at this point, I wanna say this, this is a paper in 2019, one of the many doing the same, uh, mining student data to try to predict the student performance. So this is using machine learning to predict physics courses outcomes. So they say here, that they analyze uh, their sample is like over 30,000 students. So a lot bigger than the previous sample, right? That we were talking about. And of course you have to read very much in detail because just saying, just talking about the sample size, you, you also need to worry about the uniformity and the details, but this is are their results. The conceptual pretest uh, pre test scores have very low variable importance. In, in predicting the student's uh, final performance, okay? So that conflicts with what the paper we're seeing now says. However, they, did, they do get to the same general conclusion that gender, race, or ethnicity and first-generation college goer status were not important variables to predict the student's physics course success. Okay, so they are analyzing a cumulative GPA as a, that was their favorite way to predict and then mixing all the things in it with the cumulative GPA. So you see different and, and even uh, this, this paper here is highlighting also how uh, different statistics, different ways for you to measure the statistics and analyze the statistics can generate quite different conclusions, right? So different types of statistical analysis suggest different conclusions. So, so you really have to, right, to, to take all these results now after seeing quite a few conflicting results. And I mean, not, not the general trend that it seems that gender gaps are not needed to explain this, uh, to predict the student success, but there are other factors we should be looking at. But you know how, how do people in, in finer detail explain and what are the best ways to trace this? Uh, that, that is conflicting and sometimes uh, uh, they don't agree with each other, right? So what's the best measure to, to actually measure student success in learning? What to do after predicting student performance? Some results, oh, some of them suggest interven that intervention helps, but it's still on this paper, I, I didn't read that part, but I highlighted as well, 
they they have extra information on this paper. I know I'm not giving time to the discussion. I, I'm finishing finishing soon. But if you read this, um, so there's parts on this paper where they had some extra data. And out of this extra data, uh, they were still analyzing whether there was any correlation between a, uh, giving the students some extra a supplemental, supplementary weekly help, okay? If that helped the students and they found that no, that they, it was not significantly, it didn't significantly help, okay? So they examined the effect whether supplementary weekly help help would would would, would be in a, would impact something, and they found no significant impact on the final exam score, which blows my mind as well. So so yeah, this is so complicated to put it all in one bean, right? Because all the, the the samples and the results in the paper seem to be not homogeneous in that fine grained uh, analysis. So concept inventory analysis at two-year colleges, we have lots to worry about. We have the small numbers, small statistics, we lack of consistency in the teaching methods, right? So what all these results here that we are reading here will then, how they will impact the data that we have at TOACs, right? So all these things uh, are things that, uh, yeah, I was thinking about and they worry me a lot <laughs> after reading all this. Guys, um, I spoke too much, but hopefully this was an overview that didn't kill you. If this was a class with students, they would be dead and they wouldn't be paying attention to anything. So forgive me, um, but I don't know another way of doing for this for, uh, you know, journal clubs normally are, are like that. I think you did a great job. That was really, really well done. The, 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 the first thing that came to my mind was these three institutions, um, the, 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 the demographic of students that they, they accept, all of them are at a certain SAT, ACT that's above 1400 to begin with for all three institutions. So oh, I was thinking that that's very different from the population that we serve. Yes. So that's the first thing that came to my mind. Mm -hmm. was that what they're comparing is still a very select group of students anyway. Uh, so when, if we want to do this work, our, our range is going to be much wider. Yeah, and our number, it will take a long time for us to get our, our numbers up there. And to piggyback on Feruzan's comments, I guess, in the bigger picture, I guess, I, especially now that we've seen so many inequalities in healthcare this past year with during the pandemic, uh, we're still trying to help the top 10% of the students in the country do better. I mean, part of the analysis is here is how we can improve the, the physics knowledge, the physics expertise of the top 10% of the country. Uh, and that, that sort of disappoints me that we're still, I know I understand that we have small numbers in the two-year college community, but we're actually serving a big group of students who need our help the most, or the group of students that need help the most in improving their physics abilities. So it's, it's disappointing that that these the PER community still ignores us, I guess, and I don't know how to solve that again, because we have small numbers and small voices, but it's, it's disappointing. And that was an excellent analysis, Glenda. I could never have gone through all those statistics by myself. I, I skimmed through that paper, but I'm like, no, I'm gonna read the beginning and the end. So thank you for that detailed analysis. Just to add, uh, yes, uh, I think that you made a very good point um, uh, that uh, I don't know how these top institutions, which are not only taking uh, students from US, but all over the world. And uh, they talk about AP score I don't know if the Chinese students have AP score. This is a very competitive, uh, you know, I don't know, 8%, how many percent of students uh, go into this college. But the question is, how does, this, how does this help us when the top selective students, the top performing students who just want to get into those colleges? And then we don't know if they are interested to actually do well in physics because they are in there. They want to do something. If they pass, they are okay. 
but a deep understanding of physics may not be their concern. So I, I, I wonder the same way, how is this helpful to improve physics education overall in US or elsewhere? Because these are super selective uh, mm -hmm. uh, institutions. So uh, I, I wonder why they picked us. Is that because they were there or uh, how? Yeah, uh, yeah. I certainly the authors are from those institutions. So these were people. Have you tried to get information from your statistics and your uh, from your college about SATs, about any demographics and all? It is a nightmare in my college. It can take a whole year to get something partial. It's an or it's, it's a pain. And so I can only imagine how hard it was. And these are people pretty, uh, pretty influential in their own institutions and they managed to get it. I was able to get some, because uh, after I read that paper, I was curious about my, our college. So I asked, I, I don't have the final uh, exam score, but I have the uh, scores on the uh, grade on the course. So I went back and I have now data for five years worth of uh and i also have the breakdown by gender by uh ethnicity uh, i don't have the first generation because i don't think it, we have that data i don't know if we do have it but i'll ask again later uh but i'm also interested in you know they they, they say nothing about the preparation but i think there's a connection between the preparation and also the socioeconomic background because you know it's known that the people who are able to take the act multiple times usually come from well-to-do family and so that there's a, there's a hidden variable maybe right there. And we, do, we don't have that kind of population. Our students, for instance, in fact, many years ago, I asked about that and our students in general don't take the ACT because they can come to, to our college without the ACT. So many of them don't have ACT or ACT. So I, because at one time I was trying to do a sort of correlation study on the FCI and, and SAT and I couldn't find any ACT. And the people at, in, in our administration told me and for the most part, we don't have ACT scores. So, mm. but yeah, with the socioeconomic background, we do know, and uh, most of our students are usually um, middle to low, low end in the on that scale. So, yeah. I think that's that's where the preparation hides. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, nothing socioeconomic was analyzed, and and also the motivation aspect as well, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. That's what Negusi was talking about too, right? That the students right. really buy yeah. into uh, that competitiveness and getting the best out of this and yeah. Well, one of the questions I had in mind first was, is there any disparity, at least in our college, for instance, if I look at the overall um, you know, performance, uh, just for instance, by ethnicity, is there any significant, uh, something that jumps to the eye? And right now I don't see it yet. I'm still working on the data. Uh, for instance, one I found very quickly is the female male that doesn't even exist. In fact, it's in our case, it's the opposite way. Uh, female perform way better than the I mean, not way better, but better on average than mm -hmm. the students. And if you break it down by ethnic groups, you get the whole spectrum of, you know, female in one particular ethnic group could do better than the males and so on. And you can get a sort of scheme there. I'm not sure how much it means, but there's still some interesting data to, to, to dig into. You know, on the preliminary data, I have like 250 data points only after many semesters. Mm. Uh, and I see I see variations, for instance, on the scores and you know, talking about normalized gains and performance in the form, not ethnical, but just between spring and fall admissions as well, yeah. right? Yeah. Fall up there, spring down there. Fall up there. <laughs> I mean, oh my goodness. So going to explain that now? Well, I mean, we know the, the path, but I mean, this is not, there is no pretty a nice explanation. Like, I, I don't have a very nice story behind that. We say, yeah. <laughs> well, but I was thinking maybe for us, it'd be a good initiative to maybe get, try to get the data, whatever data we have, if we mm -hmm. can put it in the form that makes it, possible to be analyzed, uh, then it would be useful to, to have it somewhere, uh, even in a, some kind of aggregate data that somebody could eventually dig into and perform some study.
because because that's it you mentioned earlier the fact that we get sort of get ignored by you know all the pr because they go where they have data and they don't have data for us so you know that's it's a famous thing and even in psychology a lot of the research in psychology is about middle class average students in in white institution and they draw conclusions for entire population when in fact all the, all the studies they did was with the students they have which were as i you know you go to any campus and they do these psychology evaluations but who do they evaluate well students between 20 and 24 and in, in university so how is that representative of the whole population i don't know okay that's awesome things are flying my mind so um so for instance, I, the way I do, for instance, the FCI, I've been using the FCI, so I stick to it, the FCI, even though I, I, I prefer all the concept inventories these days, but um, I put it everything in the fizzport.org, their portal that analyzes things and they have all the data sample from everybody else. There's enormous pool and you could increase for request. What do you have there that is to your college? Can you bring it out? So all that they will show is just the FCI that they have they can give it to us. Uh, uh, it's possible. I can see how that's possible. But yes, apart from that, so this this is something that we could have access say sooner. But um, but apart from that, uh, uh, indeed, with an institute for two year colleges, I mean, one of the main things would be for us to, I don't know, have a, st a statistician in the house or someone that can, you know accumulate all this data and start analyzing this for us yeah or even or that just we even just ch the champion or champions of of coordinating that collection of data yeah. whether you know if i think if it were available many of us would would take on some analysis role but getting all of the data from across two year colleges together in some uniform way really is a big job yeah. and that's that's was highlighted in the when we when we started discussing this, and particularly you and Chris, especially working on what's really needed in this institute, that data collection piece. This highlights highlights that necessary data. We need that central data collection, that place for TYCs to to concentrate their data. It would not be it would not only be valuable for us, but really the even folks that are doing just PER work everywhere, they could that data is available to them too. Yeah. That's a full-time job though. Which exactly. Yeah. Someone. And and so therefore, therefore it's part of a pending funding request. We want to get AP, APT behind us and asking NSF or others for money to we need this is this is a this is at least one full-time job, if not more. This is this is a major thing that we need to invest on on with the institute. But these this institute of physics of TYC physics may be far away yet but Karim there is I, I think we shouldn't reinvent the wheel at this point and really fisport.org has everything set up for all of us if we want you do your own work and you insert that data there so mm -hmm. if you're collecting gender if you're collecting final course exam you can or correlate all of that with the FCI or FMC all those concept inventories and they produce all the graphs for you or you can later produce the graphs, but they have, they show you what kind of, how the sample, how the data has to look like and all and insert everything and they get out the, all the analysis. So it's, it's pretty cool, but it all goes in a common repository. So it's something that's already made for us to have the instructor on, on instruction on how to put everything in the same format and all, and we can start doing that. So every one of us could be invited to start doing that. Mm -hmm. And 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 then with the now now it's up to us then to get in touch with these people at Fisport and see hey we're making an effort to collaborate more to this now you yeah, we want to get out the TYC information specific so can you create tools for us so that we can analyze just the TYC collectively something like that I mean they already have the tools. What is Fisport again? Fizzport.org. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Fizzport.org. Go there. You're going to love it. Thank you. So Kareem had posted on the Slack, right, about collecting data. And I yeah. really think we Great. should do this. Um, and I didn't know that Fizzport has tools already. So like that, that sounds like a great idea. 
right to oh my god guys so it is it's really i was i was amazed hold on a second yeah i know i'm i'm, I'm gonna so, da, 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 da. so i had here the fees port right uh, you go here uh home you go assessment okay it's amazing and you you can use their uh, score and compare result and etc okay so you go here explore and this is a beta beta tester it works very well it's not beta anymore you can just go and and they will explain to you how to insert your data and etc etc insert everything i have to log in and etc for you guys to to, to uh, for me to see but another day i can go over this i mean i i would be glad to go over this and show things that are that they have available over here let me already look in. I think that'd be great um one of the things I'm you see you upload your data there's a visualizer and all okay sorry oh, here we have my data yeah mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah and it explains how to upload what you want exactly how the shape of the the the, the data files have to look like etc cetera, etc cetera. so i'll stop no one has ever gotten me so excited about data analysis than you <laughs> <laughs> because this is i like the uniformity and it works and and it's a solution it's a solution to a problem that we don't have a lot of time to to do all these steps and they did it for us Maybe, maybe we need maybe we need a, a session with maybe somebody from Facebook who come and talk to us about this sort of thing. Yes. And, and then we would have a session in either one of those TYC meetings we've been having on how we could prepare for you know getting into since it's going to be the summer. Most of us are probably have a little bit more time to think than we usually do, and we start maybe planning for the fall and and the spring next year and having an idea of what to do and how to plan for things for in the fall. Right. Think, uh, I think what we are, uh, we do FCI, I see reports, but uh, uh, what I notice from this paper is that first, I don't understand why you would start with the three top institutions in the world to do any kind of uh, research to give you an idea uh, because of many factors. Um, secondly, I think uh, because mainly we don't do research, most of the community college in the physics area, we suffer. So I think we should collaborate or find a way to collaborate with the physics education. I may have data, but you know, the method of physics education, how do they re research? I was recently thinking, I go to UConn, University of Connecticut, and maybe collaborating with the area physics re education researchers with the area university and college. So we can have our own, we can write, we can you know, publish. I think we, are, we don't get the time to do research because uh, you know, we teach so many courses and uh, try to help students to advise. Mm -hmm. So our story is not being told. Our students are not being reflected on this uh, you know, research. So maybe this is one area we need to get involved to do our own research and publish. Even if someone from a university tries to do, take our data and do it, they do not reflect the way we feel, the way we see our students as we know them better and we should be able to write it. I think we should be able, that's what I, am, I, I, I feel. Well, that's why I really like Kareem's suggestion that we you know, try to collect data as because our classes are so small, our sample sizes are just going to be small and we don't, none of us have time. Well, okay, I shouldn't speak for me. I, I will soon have time. <laughs> um, but I think like, like you were saying, Nagusi, we, you know, we could invite PR to um, work on community college students or tier college students, right? And that's something I've been trying to do quite actively at all these AAPT meetings is every time they talk about somebody presents some data, I ask if they've involved the TYC. And if, uh, if not, then I suggest that they do, right? And um, because we have a lot of students and we have a we have a diverse group of students and that's that is just missing from the PER work right like they are only on research intensive 
selective universities because that's where the researchers are. But. Well, you know, a few years ago when I, I got interested in doing something about the FCI and the correlation, after I read a paper by uh, Coletta and uh, forget the first, the other name, they had done something like this at Loyola in uh, Los Angeles. And, and Phillips, Jeff Phillips, yeah. Coletta mm -hmm. and Phillips. And what? Phillips, Jeff Phillips. Oh, Coletta Phillips. And that's right, yeah, Phillips. Phillips. And they had done a study where they, at Loyola uh, in uh, LA, I think it was in LA, yeah. And they looked at ACT and, and uh, FCI scores and saw some kind of correlation there. And our, our plan was to try to reproduce that sort of thing, but we didn't have, that's when I found out that we didn't have the SAT scores. So we, we were able to find a, some sort of correlation between the pre-instruction and the, uh, the gain later uh, for some of our courses and but we we didn't push it further like now going to the you know gender and, and 10 years ago was not we didn't even think about that so maybe you should go back and, and do that sort of thing now yeah does everybody use the fci i mean what, what is going to be our common things because not everybody uses it i used to use it i did not use it all this COVID time, I have not done FCI. I think Linda, you do it, right? During F during COVID? Yeah, I started with the FCI like five years ago and I just keep investing on it because this has changed. But there is a way to correlate between FCI and the other more very popular, the force mass concept inventory, mm -hmm. the FMCI. There's a way to correlate between both of them. There are pedagogically a little, the, the FM, okay. So this paper here is amazing also. <laughs> <laughs> I know. No, it's just this little one here. Like I highlight, I put it here on the side that I thought was very good also. Analysis of the most common concept inventories in physics. What are they assessing? This is 2018 by uh, Laverty and Cavallero. Okay, and, and there's a criticism how these inventories, all of these, they are outdated. My goodness, we need better ones because nowadays we know the better way to teach is to assess scientific practices, cross con cutting concepts, right? Core ideas, uh, how, how would this, it, it new, we need new inventory. So this is all talking about that. But anyway, in a sense, the FMCI here, they discuss, it, you know, it, it touches more, boxes than the FCI. But they, there's both of them are, are sort of archaic. I mean, he's again, he's, the goal is not to disparage concept inventories, but uh, you know, it is a discussion on how we need better ones. But so it doesn't really matter if it's FMCI, FCI. And again, if you go to fisport.org, oh my goodness, they have amazing information for you. Uh, on all the possible inventories you can use, okay? Um, all the possible inventories you can use. You go assessment and you go best practice. At, I mean, they will have introductory physics concepts. They will have the FCI, then the FMCE. Those are the two most popular ones, okay? And there are many others, but those are the two most popular ones. So and you, you, you brought them to Canvas, like you copied it to Canvas? Uh, to your, uh, to your um, learning management system? Oh, yes. So I can, this is what I do. Yes, I can show you um, in my, yeah, this is, yes, I did that, especially during, oops, in during uh, these times, right? So if I go to one of my classes, for instance, let me go to this one. Uh, and I go here, um, they, they can't see, they can't do anymore. But yes, I introduced the FCI here for them. I don't know if I can take it. Ah, la, la, let me see. No, yeah, it says I can't, of course, because I, I made it, I, I, I canceled the deadline. Uh, I have to change the deadline to show. But yes, I put, I basically scanned all the pictures, wrote all the one by one, the, so they see the questions in the correct order and et cetera, and I give them 10, 30 minutes to answer it, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a way that uh, it's inside the learning management system, so it's not outside in the world, so it's still protected. And I spoke to the people uh, from Fisport and all, is this, it, because there are a lot of restrictions on what you, you shouldn't put all these things out there. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in the time of COVID and even before, they were saying, listen, more and more people are making digital delivery ways for this, this concept inventory. So there's a way to do that. And the data already comes in a nice format. <laughs> 
So I made it as a test in my learning management system. Yes, it, I call them a survey. The students don't see it as a test. It's see it as a survey and it's worth extra credit. And I make it as, I, that's, that's why it takes me so long to collect the data because it's, as, uh, it's not mandatory. I give them extra credit, but it's not mandatory. And they can take it outside of class time. I should oh, is Duane okay? Go ahead. Sorry. It, I was going to ask, uh, is Duane uh, okay with having it uh, digitally on uh, your uh, learning management system? Duane, Duane De Debian? I have no yeah. idea. No idea if Duane is okay, but that's what I yeah. do. Any other because people have been doing. <laughs> he has been keeping track of uh, how the this uh, those uh, inventories are being distributed digitally. So he keeps track of them. Oh, okay. But, so this uh, di deploying them inside the learning management system doesn't mean that they are not available to the, to the world, you know? So yeah, and the but... students don't have access to the results. They, they don't know their score and they don't know the answers. When, when I did it, I used paper. So they had it in class, but then I, I put it on Canvas and I had question one, two, three, there was nothing on Canvas, but they had the paper. And then of course I collected the paper. So they had they had to answer, you know, like uh, on Canvas, but I didn't put the text on Canvas. I, they had it on paper. That is so I, I, was, I was a little worried about, about that because yeah. nowadays, you know, they make copies of everything. Yes, <laughs> but, it, but they don't have the answers. It's just the question. It is a problem, but it is, it is the way to, uh, one way of doing things now. Is it the ideal? No. But uh, also, what is the, if you have, so for instance, I cannot have laptops online for all my students at the same time in the classroom. And I don't have a classroom desktops for all of them. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's no way for me to do that in, in, in while I'm watching them. So there's a lot of limitations when you come to think of it. So this was a solution out of so yeah. many limitations. Yeah, we, we have the, uh, I mean, usually my students have their laptops and also we do have laptops in the classroom. We don't have neither internet connection fast enough for all of them have the laptops on. They can't have the laptops on. It's just not going to connect. So, Glenda, can we invite Dwayne, Tom? They have rich experience on this uh, FCI because they were part of it. And then maybe a physics research person uh, per person some, somehow. Uh, was, would that be so? If we are interested in, you know, participating and maybe, you know, putting our own data and using it for research. All right. So we want to have a meeting just about concept inventory. <laughs> uh, if you want, I can invite Dr. Coletta and Dr. Phillips. If okay. you're interested. Yeah, that'd be I great. Them for 10 years. So they should say hopefully yes. So a peace court, I can try to reach out to Sarah McKagan. <laughs> because I, I, I've been in touch with her in the past and, and we can start building something. Okay. She also invite the other two, uh, Sid and uh, Kanin, the, the, the paper you just listed there. Because I know Steve does, he worked a lot with Tom and Dwayne in the past. So he's pretty familiar with uh, the TYC community. Mm -hmm. I think it'd be a good, uh, good speaker as well. I mean, at some point it doesn't have to so be. The way we could give the, an, a spin to this is um, we could split this into two different, like one, uh, one meeting where we just are getting advices from these people who have done it. Mm -hmm. And then another meeting on how to actually do it. <laughs> because yeah. in practice, it, you're going to use things like this board, you're going to use tools, you, we need to train ourselves in the tools, so then we would bring these people about the tools. Mm -hmm. So okay. this, I see as two separate things because the people about the tools need their time. Yeah. Actually, now you have, tools, you have uh, something to do with pre-COVID and post-COVID FCI assessment. <laughs> In the, in the fall, because if you do, because you know, I mean, I have a feeling it's going to be affecting things one way or the other. I don't know how, but uh, I feel like trashing all the data I've collected in the past months, in the past semesters. I feel like trashing them, like it's so sad. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, 
well, so good. Well, when good. are we looking at? So two meetings. Should we start with the 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 how? Uh, should we start with the fist port first so that we can go and explore a little bit first and then invite those who have done it? Okay, what do you think? I don't know. Yeah, sounds good. Two yeah, so we have idea. time to process and then when the, the, the people who have done it say things, then we, we have some kind of a background. Okay, so two first. We have a higher pre-score. <laughs> and then experts later, two first and experts later. Okay, yes. the two people are kind of experts too because they deal with that so much. But okay, so two first and experts later. Okay, so what who things are we looking at? So who wants to start organizing a meeting with the experts? I can start thinking. I mean, on the on the tools, I can. I'm th thinking of his board. Uh, okay, I can do the experts. I'll contact people. I mean, but, but also, Rosa, also Rosa, you, and, and, yeah, I know you uh, had, uh, those Colette two. And Phillips, you can Colette and Phillips, I can connect. So if we have a date uh, in mind, then I can invite them. You and I, Karen, can work together in okay. putting it together. Yeah, you guys I'll, I'll set up set, set up a date and so do like this give a two week gap between so think of a date that you want but also know two weeks before there should be the one about the tools and i will you know so let's see so, a month can we do it a month from now a meeting about the first one the tools okay two over four. okay so the other one would be what two weeks later something okay. like that if you can do it so, I know there will be restrictions. You need to see if the speakers can come. Or yeah, the, they're giving the come. Yeah, we'll see. Okay, so we are April 16. Uh, yeah, okay, so it'll be mid May and end of May. Yeah. Okay. So I have to ask them to because I think LMU finishes, I don't remember when it finishes. Early May, I want to say, but I, I have to double check again. So see if they are available and all that so yeah also we'll need to see if the people from Fisport will be available but i think they have quite a bit of people one of them will come okay mm -hmm. all right so i got it so let's let's start thinking about that that's exciting okay okay so very good all right so what about the so that would be for i mean would those be part of the paper club or do you want to keep going to paper club separately? Uh, this is something else. The okay. journal club journal depends club. on people's journal club depends on people's and now we, whoever wants to submit, I, it's better not to be me. They need to be all the people. <laughs> and, oh, yeah, a couple of papers I had in mind that I have to go back and check on them. Okay. So whatever, you know, speaks to you, excites you, propose it, come and talk. Okay. I'll do that. All right. So, uh, so the, this this Fisport meeting would not be a journal club. It would just be like a workshop in a sense, okay. because they do give. This is what I've been workshops on Fisport. Fisport when the APT meetings they offer workshops. So I've been to a few of those, and that's how I learned. So I'm going to ask them to do a mini workshop for us. Okay. Good. Wonderful. Okay. All right, guys. All right. That was a good idea. All right. So, Karim, so, you're on Slack, right? Yeah, uh, Slack, Slack. Okay, everybody Slack yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if you can. Thank you, Glenda. That was great. I read the paper, but I think you did a great job on that paper. I think the data, yeah. Thank you. It was great. Thank you so much. Yes. Bye, guys. That's wonderful. Thank All right. you. Take care. Thank you. Bye -bye. Have a great weekend. You too. Thank you.